I, I think it's pretty solid advice. Groups of cells in different parts of your brain, they're all connected. The statistics just don't back it up. There's nothing here. Any complex life you find has mitochondria. We have discovered things from athletes juicing. My name is Matt Caberline, and welcome to the OptiSpan Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. On today's episode, what I'm going to do is give you a pretty brief and high level overview of two recent papers that have been published that have gotten quite a bit of attention in the field, also picked up a bit by the popular media. Both of these studies present mouse lifespan results looking at two different interventions. And what I want to do today is accomplish a couple of things. One, give you some tools that you can use to sort of think about how you evaluate these kinds of new studies. And then I'll give you my sort of overview thoughts on how this fits into the larger context in the field. So the first study we're going to look at today is a paper that was published in Nature in mid-July. It's titled Inhibition of IL-11 Signaling Extends Mammalian Health Span and Lifespan. And the second paper comes from Linda Partridge's lab. It is a preprint uh, published on BioArchive. The title of that paper is A Combination of the Geroprotectors Trametinib and Rapamycin is More Effective Than Either Drug Alone. So one study looked at inhibition of IL-11 and its effects on lifespan and health span in mice, and the other looked at the combination of two drugs, trametinib and then, of course, rapamycin, which um, we've talked a lot about on the podcast, really the gold standard for a drug intervention to impact the biology of aging. And that paper looked at the combination compared to each individual treatment alone. Um, I should say I'm done a deep dive on the IL-11 paper that uh, is available on the podcast channel. So if you really want to get into the, the weeds in that paper, certainly encourage you to check out that episode. Today, I'm really only going to look at the lifespan results. And again, the goal here is to give you some tools for how you can evaluate mouse lifespan studies and then try to put it into context with the larger um, picture in the field. So first thing I want to do is talk about what we call the 900-day rule. This is just a rule of thumb. It is not meant to be, you know, a very rigorous evaluation of longevity studies, but it's really meant to be a rule of thumb that the scientific community can apply to mouse longevity studies to sort of get a feel for how robust does the result seem. This is particularly important when it's really the first time that a new result has been presented, uh, where we don't have replication yet, where we just kind of need to get some confidence boundaries around whether or not that result is likely to be real and robust. And the literature is chock full of studies where a lifespan extension was reported that did not turn out to be reproducible. And usually in those studies, the controls, the untreated animals were short-lived compared to where they should be. So this is really the basis for the 900-day rule. And the rule is very simple. So this is a, a preprint that um, that we published along with Brian Kennedy and Camille Pavis, um, where we looked at a lot of the mouse data that's in the literature and came up with this rule of thumb. And essentially, um, this is stated in the abstract, I think, pretty clearly. In the absence of independent replication, a putative mouse longevity intervention should only be considered with high confidence when control lifespans are close to 900 days or if the final lifespan of the treated group is considerably greater than 900 days. That's the 900-day rule of thumb. We want the controls in the absence of treatment to be close to 900 days. What, is, what does close mean? 850 to 950, okay? Or, and preferably and, we want the treated group that's supposedly long-lived to be much greater than 900 days on average. So what we look at is the median or mean, median is usually easier, lifespan of the groups. And we ask, how does this compare to 900 days? That's it. So now I'm going to show you actually how to apply this rule in these two very specific use cases. Okay, so the first paper is the IL-11 paper. They did lifespan analyses on two different treatments that reduced IL-11 levels in the animal. So IL-11 is a circulating molecule uh, that... Um, signals through a receptor and affects longevity, according to this paper. So they have a genetic knockout of IL-11, 
And they have a monoclonal antibody therapy where they can basically block the signaling. So there's still IL-11 circulating, but they block the binding to the receptor uh, to, uh, to prevent signaling through the pathway. Okay, so they did lifespan studies in both of those cases. In the monoclonal antibody experiment, they actually started the treatment in middle age. So this is interesting from a translational perspective. And again, I get into much more detail on this in the dedicated episode to this paper. So we're going to look at these two lifespan curves. In this case, the sexes are pooled. They did break them out by individual male and females in the paper, if you're interested. And the first thing we want to do is evaluate this using the 900-day rule. So how do you do that? It's pretty easy. So you want to look at the survival curve. You're going to start with the y-axis. And this is either going to run from 0 to 1 or 0 to 100, depending on whether they're looking at the, the ratio, the, the cumulative survival probability, or the percent survival. Okay, regardless, you wanna go halfway down. So it's either gonna be 50% or 0.5. Halfway down the y-axis, that's where half of the animals have died. You're gonna go straight across till you hit the curve, and then you're gonna go straight down to the x-axis, okay? Wherever you hit the x-axis is the median survival of the population in this experiment. And we're talking in this case, the black line about the controls or the wild type animals, the not genetically modified. In this case, the median lifespan is 121 weeks, which works out to about 850 days. So in the ballpark of the 900 day rule, okay, that's pretty good. Now we wanna ask, what does the treated group, the supposedly long-lived group, look like for median lifespan? It actually looks pretty good in this experiment. I can tell just by a quick glance. And when you do this a few times, it becomes very easy. Looks pretty good. So in this case, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to start at 0.5, go across till we hit the treated curve, and then drop straight down to the x-axis. The treated animals lived about 150 weeks for their median lifespan. That's about 1,050 days. That meets the 900-day rule. So this looks pretty solid, okay? We do the same thing with the monoclonal antibody-treated experiment. We get roughly the same results, about 850 days for the controls, actually maybe even a little bit longer, about 1,085 days for median for the treated. Okay, so this looks promising. It looks like a solid result based on the 900-day rule. Again, we always want to wait for replication before we really are super confident, but I'm a believer. This looks like a real result. The fact that they did it two different ways, I also think adds a lot of confidence. This is probably a real and robust result. So now we can ask the question, how does this compare to what has been shown previously in the literature? And there are a couple of things that I typically look at to get a feel for how does this stack up? One is rapamycin. And the experiment that I like to compare to is an experiment from my lab where we treated mice for three months with rapamycin from 20 to 23 months of age. And then we stopped the treatment and we just let them live out the rest of their lives. It was published in 2016 in eLife. And so we can look at that data and we can ask the question, if we plot the new data, the IL-11 data in this case, on top of the survival data from that 2016 paper, how does it compare? So we're going to do this with only the monoclonal antibody experiment because that's the one that had the biggest effect in the new nature paper. And it turns out it's pretty comparable. They didn't actually finish the experiment in the paper, so I can't say anything about maximum lifespan. But for median lifespan and for down to median lifespan, the curves are pretty much right on top of each other. You would have to really try hard to convince yourself there's any real difference here, certainly not a statistical difference. So I think we can say with a pretty reasonable level of confidence, this is probably a real result. And it's pretty impressive, actually. There isn't much in the literature that can match this rapamycin experiment. So this looks pretty good. It's a pretty solid result. Is it better than rapamycin? Not obviously better. Maybe if you were to do this experiment over and optimize IL-11 uh, inhibition, maybe you could do better than rapamycin, but there's no reason to believe from this paper that this is better than rapamycin, but it might be as good, at least in terms of lifespan. So again, we can get into health span, and, and I do that in the episode that does a deeper dive into the paper. So looks like a solid result. Okay. But the other experiment I like to compare to, to really know, is this a game changer, is an experiment that Rick Weindrick and Roy Walford did 
all the way back in 1986. So this experiment uh, is really what I think the gold standard is for a non-genetic intervention for lifespan in mice. Uh, again, Rick Weindrick, Roy Walford, 65% caloric restriction gave a very robust effect on lifespan. And you can see this new IL-11 monoclonal antibody experiment is maybe half the, the magnitude of lifespan extension that was seen in that study. So this really, in my view, is a solid result. It's on par with, you know, what the best of what has been done recently, but doesn't really move the needle in terms of the largest effects on lifespan that have been reported. Um, so that's kind of where where I fit this into the larger landscape uh, in the field. And again, if you want to want more information, check out the episode dedicated to this paper. There's actually a lot of interesting stuff in there about health span as well. Okay. So what about the study from Linda Partridge's lab where they looked at the combination of two drugs, rapamycin plus trametinib, and their interpretation is that the combination is better than either single treatment alone. And you can see from the lifespan curves in that paper that the data that they show are consistent with that interpretation. So the controls untreated are the blacks, each individual treatment is the green and the purple, and then the double treatment is the orange. And what you can see is that the orange survival curve is farther right than any of the other curves, consistent with the idea that the combination treatment led to the longest lifespan or the greatest survival. Okay, so we're only going to look in this case at the combination treatment, and we're going to do exactly the same exercise. First, let's apply the 900-day rule. Okay, so we're going to compare the controls and the combination. In this case, the controls lived about 800 days for females, 700 days for males. So 800 days is kind of on the borderline. That's not terrible. It's not great. 700 days, I'm starting to get worried. Those controls are shorter lived than we would really like to see. And as I've already alluded to, often in the literature, when we start to get down into 700, 600, sometimes 500, 450 days for the controls, you tend to start getting results that don't turn out to be reproducible. Or if they are reproducible, the magnitude of effect is actually much smaller than what is initially reported. So I'm starting to get a little nervous about 700-day median lifespan controls in this case. Okay, what about the combination treatment group? In this case, the treated animals for median for females lived about 1,100 days. That's pretty darn good. And for males, about 950 days. That's okay. That looks like it's probably a real result. So I kind of look at this and I'm like, yeah, I believe the combination treatment extends lifespan compared to the controls. But is it really the case that the double treatment is better than the single treatments if this was done in the context of an optimized experiment for either single treatment alone? And I'm not so convinced. And the reason why I'm not convinced is if we now compare the combination treatment with that rapamycin experiment from 2016, and we put the curves on top of these curves, as you'll see, it's not so clear that you're doing better than rapamycin alone. In fact, in the case of the males, the long-lived combination treatment is actually only as long-lived as the untreated controls from that 2016 paper. This is what I'm talking about, how the, the, the lifespan of the controls, there's quite a bit of variation in the literature, and when you get short-lived controls, it can kind of um, make it look like there's a big effect when maybe there isn't really a a big effect. It becomes hard to interpret. And even in the case of the females, when we look at the combination treatment, it's really right on top of the rapamycin alone treatment from 2016. So one interpretation certainly is consistent with, with what the authors claim, which is that the combination is better than either single treatment. Another interpretation is if you were to optimize the treatment with rapamycin alone, you might actually not get any further benefit from trametinib. And the fact that these things sort of act in the same network, um, I think fits that idea that if you optimized the signaling through the network for lifespan, you might not actually see any additive benefit from combining the two. And this is important when we start to think about therapeutic strategies to optimize health span and lifespan. You really want to know whether or not a combination is 
having a additive or synergistic effect because it's targeting different mechanisms fundamentally, or if everything's really acting on the same network or the same pathway. So a little bit unclear in this case, I'm not convinced that there really is any additivity to the combinations if you were to optimize either treatment alone. And I think this is supportive of, of that interpretation. And so again, the other thing we can do now is also compare it to the 1986 caloric restriction study from Weindrick and Walford. And as we saw before, the combination treatment here is really only about half the lifespan extension that was achieved in that study from, you know, almost 40 years ago now. So again, I would not characterize this as really any sort of game changer in the longevity field. Might have therapeutic value beyond what we're doing today, but really isn't going to fundamentally change the way we think about targeting the biology of aging in, in any significant way. Okay. So again, take-homes in my view are both of these look like real results in the sense that I believe that IL-11 inhibition or rapamycin plus trametinib can extend lifespan in mice. IL-11 depletion looks comparable to rapamycin. No real reason to believe it's better, but it's in the same ballpark. Um, I'd say it's unclear, again, whether rapamycin plus trametinib is actually better than rapamycin alone. I think the experiment needs to be done under conditions where rapamycin alone is closer to what we think is the optimal magnitude of lifespan extension with rapamycin by itself. And again, neither study approaches what was accomplished with caloric restriction almost 40 years ago. I think both may be clinically viable strategies, but they're not game changers for longevity. And I also think it would be premature for anybody watching this video to run out and try to get an IL-11 antibody or to start taking trametinib on top of rapamycin if you're taking rapamycin already. Um, I think we really need more data before that makes any sort of sense. And the final thing I'll leave you with is I have no doubt that there will be charlatans who if they're not already, we'll very soon be selling supplements claiming that they can reduce IL-11 levels. Um, in the absence of them actually showing you that they can reduce IL-11 levels, I would say run away. Don't pay any attention to those snake oil salespeople. Um, and even if they do show you that they can reduce IL-11 levels with their supplements, it's not clear that that's actually going to have significant benefits in people. I think there's reason to think it might, but we don't actually have any great data to support that. So it may be premature, even if they are able to show you that they can reduce IL-11 levels. But my guess is they won't actually show you that. They'll just start selling stuff and making claims that aren't true. So ignore those people. Don't waste your money on supplements that claim to reduce IL-11 would be my advice. Okay, so that's it. Uh, hopefully that was helpful and hopefully you have some tools now that can help you in the future when people report effects on lifespan in mice to be able to very quickly look at the data, draw your own conclusions, and don't get lost in the hype that um, shows up in the popular media. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And thanks for watching the OptiSpan podcast.